and the duck is the female. <laughs> and I said, we can't go back that far. We haven't got time to educate the consumer. <laughs> this was a true story. Roger Slottich yesterday in the meat department said the conservative was very, very conservative. He said it's not 60 or 70 percent, he says 80 percent. Now the farmers want what you got. He also said, when I get into a car, now Roger's about, what, 35 years old? Something like that, I don't know. He said, when I get into a car with a young man that my age on the farm, my age is farming, he says, in 10 minutes, we're in tune. He has the same problems that I have. He wants to do something. A few years ago in my office in Corning, Iowa, I asked some people who were up there to a young farmers meeting to come over. I wanted to talk to them. Is there anybody here from, that was at the young farmers meetings in Corning, Iowa? There are some of you here. They sat around, there wasn't enough chairs, and they sat around in front of where I was standing and I, in ending up my explanation of what they could do, I said, Last of all, come in and take this organization over. Get in leadership roles. Make this organization work for you. I said, I haven't got any milk to run through it anymore. We built it. So they seemed surprised that I'd say something like that. Yet I recognized that here were young people either on the farm or going to be in farming, wanted what we got, but they were surprised that someone was saying, come on in and take it over. I want to congratulate those young people and recognizing how they felt, I've been one of the strongest advocates of getting young people involved in this organization. I've seen what they could do. At the same time, I have to congratulate everyone in here that started this organization, that became part of it and helped build it. Do you know that yesterday when I heard the man say, how many of you remember when you hated to sell the cream and the eggs, you needed the money for groceries, but you remembered you liked it for ice cream? Do you know that I saw 75% of the hands go up, mine included? That means we remember back a long ways. I wish it would have been 10% and the others 100%. Then I'd have seen young people in here taking over. Now I say I congratulate both of you. Let me tell you of the potential we have. It'll be two weeks tomorrow that I filled a speaking engagement for Devon at Brigham Young University. A request came to the office to have someone come out and speak to the economic students who have agricultural background. Devon couldn't make it and I took that meeting and they gave me 50 minutes. I talked for 40 and this seemed to be entirely new to those people. But there were always a few people in the room I could see shaking their head yes. When I had spoken for 40 minutes, and by the way, I went to the board and I drew out bargaining, exactly as I saw it in the cattle division yesterday, of four processors and then a block of production and how they'd have to bid. And this seemed so simple to these young people. They said that would work. I asked them if they thought it would work. Sure it would. But after I spoke for 40 minutes, I said, I'd like to have you ask me some questions because maybe I haven't touched on things that you'd like to know. And the questions came, good questions. What about surplus? What about other farm organizations? One young man said, what benefit would it be if my dad would join your organization? My answer was nothing if he joined alone. This is collective bargaining. And it seemed so reasonable to these young people. They were so receptive. 
We had one minute to go, and then there was another professor standing at the podium wanting to start his next class and bring him in. I said, I got one more minute. And a guy that had been shaking his head yes jumped up, raised his hand, I want to ask five questions. I said, go ahead. They were very basic questions, again, pertaining to why did you have holding actions? They accepted it. Sounds reasonable. What do you think of supply and demand? I said, you can't have supply and demand working for you if you don't have a competitive economic system where buyers have the same strength as sellers or sellers are as strong as buyers. They said, we know that. These are the young people. What I didn't know was after this 50 minutes, they said, come on, we want to take you up to lunch. And it wasn't a student asking me the questions, it was a professor. And he said, I want to thank you for answering those questions. He said, It'll, there's more credibility now because that's what I've been teaching my students. And I thought that was pretty good in Brigham Young University. That afternoon, they took me out. They offered this organization a large auditorium in, in Provo, Utah, free of charge, any time that the National Farmers Organization want to care, call the people together in the state of Utah on their campus. This past year, I've heard the excuse that farmers are just too busy. They can't get out and do what needs to be done. Well, I say anybody thinking that is absolutely wrong. I was too busy, too. And it was 20 years ago this month that I said, well, I'll ask a few farmers if they'll come and listen to an NFO speaker. I was also too busy, and 20 years later, to this month, here I am. You think I'm wrong? There's a young man and woman in this crowd that attended their first NFO meeting. It'll be a week tomorrow. The first meeting that was held in the county in a year. They were going to elect officers. At midnight, less than a week ago, that man was asked if he would be the county president of NFO. And he was elected and he accepted. They elected officers. After he was elected at midnight, less than a week ago, they said, would you go to the National Convention? And he and his wife said, well, we've got three small children. We've got 500 hogs to be taken care of. But he said, I believe it's worth it, and I'll see if I can do it. He's from Chippewa County, Minnesota, and he's busy as any young man can be and he's 28 years old, and I'd like to ask Mr. and Mrs. Randy Peterson if you'd please stand up from Minnesota. <laughs> Do you still think young people are too busy and not interested and won't become part of this organization if we just ask them? And without them, there's no future, is there? Because 20 years from now, that young man's going to be 48. How old are you going to be? <laughs> so those of you that were at the dance last night know I celebrate one, too, this month. 20 years from now, I'm not going to do, be doing much for the NFO, but Randy is. Well, you know, that's when I get to the heart of what I'm going to say. <clears throat> How many of you people believe there's one young couple like Randy and his wife in your county? 
How many of you believe there's a young couple in your county, 28 years old, three children, busy as the devil, and want to make their ag living in agriculture? There, uh, you mean, oh, I left, there's only two, well, I guess we better quit. Oh, there are more. You know yourself, there's some in every county. And we can't use the excuse anymore that they're going to the city and get a job, can we? We used to say it, didn't we? How are we going to keep them on the farm? No problem anymore. There's no jobs in the city. And they want exactly what you and I built for them. Somebody said last night when I was thinking about this, they said, why don't you ask everybody in this audience to start throwing their pennies in a jar right now and sponsor a young couple? Sponsor a young couple to come to this convention a year from now. You come too. I've heard the excuse, there's too much, cost too much money to come to the convention. How much are you going to take out of your milk check next year by not coming to the convention, not being organized? Will it be the expense of a national convention? How much did it cost you this past year on the price of the grain? Because we were not overflowing and really dedicated to this. Fred Lucas from Indiana, I mentioned him a year ago. I said I want to talk about him again this year. He said in the hall out there, he said, I can't sell my grain for these prices. He's right, he'll go broke. But I'm going to tell every grain farmer, if they want to do something about it, sell a little bit of it. Put it through the organization. We have never moved prices unless production was going through the organization. Sell part of it. I agree, these prices will break you and I'll guarantee you one thing, the grain farmers are letting yourself in for a government as being your buyer for the rest of your life. And that's the group of people that want cheap food. And you can't afford to sit there and let them have it. It's got to start moving through an organization that's got the goal that you have, and that's cost of production and the profit. Any other way, and Erhard thinks of the right, you are doomed to failure. Because that's exactly what they want, that cheap food. Now, Bob Arndt, just a minute ago, said that they, he gave you a way and what he wants done in your county structures, the materials to do it. I'm going to say that you can turn agriculture upside down between now and January 30th of 1983, if you want to. And you know, I went to meetings where People would get ahead of me before I'd start to say and, or talk, and they'd say, don't tell us to go down the road. We've heard that so much, all it does is demoralize us again. It was getting like Devon said yesterday, you didn't want to come to a meeting because you, first we told you to bring your checkbooks and you came. Then later on, we didn't want to say anything about checkbooks, but you suspected it, so you didn't come, and you wouldn't certainly ask anybody else to come, and we didn't blame you. You don't want to hear about going down the road. It isn't the problem that all of us have, <clears throat> that we would mind driving. That don't bother us. It bothers us that we don't have something spectacular when we drive into a farmer's place or a rancher's place, and we don't quite know what to say to him to get him to join. Is that right? If you thought that you knew what to say and could get him, you'd do it. Because I've seen people that have had success in this. Jay Parton, are you here, Jay? From Tennessee. Back there? Somebody came and said, Jay Parton is having the most fun he's ever had recently because of the members he's signed. Now let me tell you what he told me in his own words, and there he stands. He said, the last one closed me. A close is when you ask the guy to put his name on the membership agreement. And I talked to Jay the other day, and he said, I've never had so much fun enrolling new members in the NFO. And the last one, he said, I laid my things out on the hood of the car and talked to him just a minute. He said, what do you want me to do? He asked Jay what he wanted him to do. And Jay said, 
enroll. And the guy says, all right. <laughs> and Jay is having fun doing that, but you don't have that fun if you don't make the contact. So I'm not going to tell you what to say that's going to cause you any embarrassment. How many of you people can drive in to a farmer or rancher and say, my name is, tell him your name, I'm a member of the National Farmers Organization. <clears throat> I want to give you a brochure to show you how you can benefit by using the NFO. How many of you would be afraid or would resent just doing that and hand him a professional brochure? That's all I ask you to do. Now comes the hard question. How many of you would do it? What's the matter with the rest of you? Why would you not take a professionally drawn brochure, turn into the driveway of somebody you don't even know, and tell him who you are, that you're a member of the National Farmers Organization, and here's a brochure that will show you how you can benefit by going through the National Farmers Organization programs. That's all you got to do. How many of you would do it? Now, how many of you would do that? Now, raise your hands high, because I don't know if there's any supporter. Your directors are supporting it. All right, you know there's a lot of hands like this. I saw them. I consider them up. <laughs> How many of you would like to turn agriculture around by January 30th of 1983? That's how many are going to do what I'm going to ask you. I want you to flood your department in Corning, Iowa with telephone calls ordering 100 brochures. I want you to call your department based on the commodity in your area and between now and January 30th make it a special effort and do it to walk into somebody and don't walk into the participating member. And you know better yet, don't read this thing. I wish none of you'd read it. And I'll tell you why. Because by the fifth contact, you're thinking it's no good and I ought to have something new. That's right, you'll want a new brochure. Remember the person you give it to, it's brand new to him. You don't have to say a word to him. Now your names are listed out here. Who's at this convention? And you said you'd do that. You may never come back again, huh? I want you to call in and order a hundred brochures from your department. That's the way to do it. I talked to Lee Elliott. And if you'll promise me, and I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll guarantee the National Board of Directors, the officers, and Devon Woodland that I'll do it. And I'll do it on weekends. And it won't cost this organization a penny for my time or my gas. And I want the National Board of Directors to remember that you question me at your meeting in January and make me come up with the names because I want you to write down the name of the person you gave it to. But I'll tell you what will be happening by January 30th. You have so much reception to your program out there that some of you are going to have to say, I don't have a membership agreement. I'm sorry, I can't let you enroll today. You think it's that bad or that tough? There's over 80% of the con people contacted want what you've got. Don't blame those out there. Blame me. 
Blame that board and blame yourself that we don't have this thing overturned. Randy will do it. Randy will do it. He's 28 years old. He became president less than a week ago. When he and his wife can find a babysitter for three children and somebody to take care of those hogs, you mean to tell me that in nearly two months they won't hand that out to somebody? We had the enthusiasm, I said one time, didn't we? I've seen the day in, this audit in an auditorium like this when Devon made that announcement that we had won on every count in that lawsuit, that auditorium would have raised the roof. You bet we would have. We gave a nice, polite applause. You know why? We're tired and old. <laughs> That's right. Randy and his wife aren't. That's the difference. And we've got one more thing to do before you and I can afford to sit back. And that's to do what Bob Arndt has asked and to see that they get into the hands of the farmers. If there's a thousand people in here, that's a hundred thousand people. We'll have that brochure. I know that many of us have the fault that we, we don't know and can't walk in and come out without an argument or the guy don't want to talk to you, I'll guarantee you he'll take that brochure today. Let him say whatever he wants then. You've made your speech. My name is Ed Graff. I'm with the National Farmers Organization. I want to give you this brochure to show you the benefits of going through the National Farmers Organization programs. Now there's nobody can say that's too tough. I expect that to be done, and you better expect it to be done of me, too. So I'm challenging you. I'm busy, too. And now I'll close. It's very, very late. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you give me about 15 minutes while we'll be through, and but I would take, like to take just a little bit of time here for just a few moments. I'd like to express appreciation to the press for their courtesy, hospitality, and their interest. I think we have had probably as good a press coverage in this convention as I remember, recall. Uh, sometimes we've even had just a little too much interest by the press. Uh, been a little interrupting at times, but we always try to work with them because they have the ability to tell the story after we tell it to them. Now, it doesn't matter what happens in this convention. I don't suppose there was a lot of grain signed up. I don't suppose there's a lot of cattle signed up, and I don't suppose there was many delivered while you were here. But what's going to determine the success of this convention is what you do when you go home. If you go home and you tell your friend as you ride home how good it was, you enjoyed it, and go home and wait till next year, we've both wasted our time, haven't we? But if you go home and decide, say, then you know, there may be something we can do if I do such and such. And that would be what you've been asked to do here today, plus what you've been asked to participate in in the commodity meetings. Here a short time ago, a year or so ago, I said to the board, as we said in meeting, I said, you know, I'd like you to take and put down the name on a piece of paper overnight, the 10 most influential farmers and ranchers in your immediate area, those that you think would be uh, influential in the community, that would be leaders if they were members of the National Farmers Organization. Of course, they were interested in it because here's Tom, Dick, and Harry that nobody had really talked to, maybe even shied away from, and everybody kind of envied, but nobody really said, uh, Tom, Dick, or Harry, wouldn't you like to become a part of a progressive farm organization? Nobody had really done that. They put the ten names down, brought them in the next morning, and I says, now sit down and make two copies. I want one. 
They sat down and made two copies, and then they passed one of them in. I said, keep the other. They did. I said, when you come into the next board meeting, I want to report on your visit to each one of those ten people. It was a little bit of a dirty pool, but, you know, they now had outlined the people they'd like to see in the organization by name. We had their name and their ten names, and the thing that was uh, surprising is how much success they had when they went out and talked to those ten people. They weren't all successful. All of them didn't join, but nevertheless, they made a contact and found out that it wasn't as hard as some may have thought. Now, when you go back home, there's going to be things that are going to be of interest to you, and I want to just mention some that I think perhaps we ought to talk about a little bit. There is a move out in the country, and I'm not being critical of it at all, and that's the penny sale concept and some of the activity that's uh, taking place. What we want to remember is that any success in that type of program is temporary. No permanent solution. Those who become in those unfortunate circumstances do need help. They do need time to get their affairs in order. And perhaps we ought to participate as individuals in those areas. I'm not going to discourage anyone from doing that. But don't let it become the main focus of your activity because that solution is not really a solution. It's postponing having to deal with the real problem and real solution. And so those activities will be there, and your activity in them will be a personal decision. Now, the press has been bothering me here for the last hour, and I'll tell you why. The president just made an announcement, he and the secretary, that they were going to take and make payment in kind of grain for set aside of acreage. And the press wanted to know what our reaction to that was. In other words, what he was saying, if you will set aside so many acres of your ground that you were planning on planting to wheat, we will give you so many bushel of grain payment in kind rather than payment in monies. Well, he's giving the farmers back something that ain't worth a heck of a lot. And I suppose they said, what will your people do? I said, the first thing they'll do is put a pencil to it and find out if there's anything in it. They'll have to put a value on those acres that's being set aside and what the crop would be or returned to them if it were planted versus that payment in kind that's being offered. It's going to pose another problem, surely. In that same uh, news release, just released, he's going to allow that to be fed, or you can decide to feed if you want. Now, if you have 10,000 bushel more of grain to feed, what are you going to do? You're going to increase your herd, whether it be hogs, whether it be dairy cows, whether it be cattle. You're going to have to increase it to feed that grain, and meat and dairy has already got a problem in that area. And so it really isn't going to solve the problem. It's going to compound it. Well. My suggestion is put a pencil to it, see in effect what it will do. But if all that grain were put together into one program, not just dumped in on the market, if that loan has been received by a producer, he's going to be more inclined to sell that payment in kind on a down market than he is on an up market. And so it's going to have a tendency to destroy already a pathetic market in grain. But if that grain were all put together into the hands of one agent and then they had that volume of grain, whatever that may be, then you can have market effect on an upside. Let's do our part. Be careful going home. The roads are slick. There's a lot of ice. Remember this story. There lies the body of William J., who died maintaining his right-of-way. He was right, dead right, as he sped along, but he's just as dead as if he'd been dead wrong. Be careful on the roads. Take your time. Have a safe journey home. Thank you, and it's been good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be seated for just one moment now, and I'll call for a motion to adjourn the board meeting. Is there a motion? Motion here. Is there a second? Those in favor, stand up and start moving toward the rear. There will be a board meeting.
immediately in room 401 in this building. 104, I'm sorry, 104.